totally naive. It never occurred to me that anybody who weave a blanket was doing it. But I found a weaving school right away, and it was one of these, for me, remarkable weaving schools where the girls were all set up with beautiful Norwegian colors and designs. And I wove, and I took the class all over again because it was so wonderful. And I brought a little girl, and I came home, and I hadn't a clue as to how to set up the board. <laughs> and I found McIntyre, who lived nearby. And then I was back years later, and I have studied a lot in Norway since then. But it was that little label that said hand woven that got me started. <laughs> um, for me, I studied fashion design at FIT, and then kind of kept falling into figuring out more and more about textiles. I took a screen printing class, then a computer design class. And then when I had some kids up here in Rhode Island, um, I was in the Mermaid's Pearl, a uh, local shop in North Kingston, and they had a rigid pedal class. And so rigid pedal for any non-weavers is only two shafts, so it's kind of a smaller center loom. And right away I was like, I feel like we could do more. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so just kind of fell down the, the rabbit hole a little bit of weaving, where I just keep trying to mix more and more colors and make it more and more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in addition to the challenges, do you want to talk about the design for inspiration process? Um, inspiration for me, <clears throat> often it's music or art, paintings. Um, it's not cones of yarn, that comes second. But for example, I was at a Boston Symphony Orchestra, a concert some years ago. And I heard a fabulous violinist, uh, Anna Sophie Muter, who was playing. She had this beautiful turquoise gown. She had a beautiful figure. She had there was silver and gold in it. And the music was wonderful. And it was Tchaikovsky. And I just remember coming home that night drawing gold curves. And then, then after that, I could go to my yarn stash and choose the right colors that went with it. And that's when I wove this yardage. And I wove, actually, I started out with that piece on the wall, that long blue piece. And that was her shape, her sparkle, the music undulated that way, rhythm of the music. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that inspires me a lot. It's very abstract. And the colors of the yarns come later. Um, Paul Clay is an, an artist whose work I admire tremendously. And I can look at that and see if it's geometrics. I might want something geometric out of it. But I use his colors. And then from his colors, I go to fibers and colors that I want. So it's, that's my inspiration process very often. For me, it's generally museum shows, or just one piece at a museum show. Or show. A lot of times, obviously, color, just like two colors next to each other. Um, a lot of times, I'll, what, how most of my pieces have gotten done is one museum show, and then the emotions that I had at that moment during, or my feelings looking back at that show. That's how I end up kind of coming up with um, a plan for a weaving. Okay. Is, so you plans, did any, I didn't want to see people turn out really quiet. <laughs> Very often. Um, if, it's, if it's kitchen towels that I do, and I like to weave kitchen towels, I know the yarns I'm going to use, I know what the colors will work, will look like, and I may choose a new or slightly different weave structure just to explore it. But I have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen. Um, but for wall hangings, it's, um, it always surprises me. And I have a very clear picture in my mind of what I want. And I, so I get out my yarns and 
I've chosen the weave structure, I've put it on the loom, and it just doesn't work. And what I have found for me often is that I incorporate too many ideas into the first one, and I so I decide to eliminate, to simplify. I don't need every single different block structure. I can combine them and make it simpler. And I, I very often will put on a warp for three projects and get three of something off the warp. And inevitably, the third one is the one that's successful. The first two are too busy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a learning process. Um, for me, uh, <coughs> the first project I did at Norma, I was so excited. She said, just come in with a project and a plan. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I found this little perfect little hearts that I was going to do dish towels. And we put it on the loom and we started weaving. And it just didn't look like hearts. <laughs> <laughs> and I hated the colors. And I was just like so ready to be done with it. But then at the end, so at Norma's school, the Summer Center School, there's a pretty strict rule that you have to weave to the very, very end of your warp. <laughs> and at the very end of this warp, I was like, I was done with these terrible dish towels. There were too many pastels, which is always a, a downfall. Too many pastels in one thing is just. But I combined, you know, the warp was purple, and I did this really striking green with it. And so hating the whole process, whatever, 10 weeks of getting these dish towels done. But it, then at the end, I just did like six inches at the end of a warp with these two really bright colors. And it was like the negative, and then just it ended up being amazing. And I love using those two colors together. So even if something starts out bad, there's always time, I think, with finishing a warp to find like a new direction. Absolutely. <coughs> so, obviously, there's been progressions in individual works. Um, did you, could you say something about the progression of your weaving skills more broadly? Sure. Did you, did you say that again? The progression of your, of your weaving skills. How has it changed over time? Yes, how it's changed over time. How you, how you, this experience is doing it. Primarily, it's doing it again and again and again, and finding where things work, where where pieces are accepted. Um, for knowing that I've developed skills, I think it's a, a lot of it is the, the good luck we have, the good fortune to have this wonderful exhibit. Um, to me, it's just so wonderful to see things on the wall instead of hanging in a closet. In a closet, you don't know whether they really look successful or not, but you get things on the wall, and if you can get them near other things on the wall, and then if you have someone like Michelle who put together this amazing collection and made a beautiful show out of it, um, that's when you know that you've gotten, gotten some skills and you're developing some success. Um, for me, although I do not write well, and I don't write a whole lot, I struggled with it, but I've formed, well, I've written with collaboration with others two books that I'm really proud of. The first one, there were four of us wrote about Bertha Gray Hayes and her designs. Actually, it was a fairly easy book to put together, but the writing was strenuous for me. And the second book, Andre Textiles, um, I'm really proud of because it's work that I've worked on, and Gretchen Light got here worked with me. She showed up every Saturday or Sunday afternoon and we would agonize over the next paragraph or pages or what I had done. Really it's a wonderful book. I mean, I'm not a weaver and I absolutely love it. Well, I'm, I'm just very proud of that. So I think it's, it's steps like that when you can finally recognize that something has been successful. I think for me, so uh, you can kind of see my progression. The book that you Yeah. Retrospective. Yeah. There's so much to remember. This um, solo with base piece is kind of the first direction I took with trying to really work in bold colors. And I remember going to Norma and being like, okay, I have the idea, but how do I like make this work? And we both kind of went back and forth. 
and you know figured out the weave structure for the weavers summer and winter and um so then from there which is all straight lines i did i figured out how to do the cur curvy lines and then um, then i did double weave and then double weave pickup but every project i've done i've been able to talk to Norma and feel like I'm maybe 10% understanding how fast she's talking back at me. <laughs> <laughs> we always say that Norma's just an encyclopedia. So you're, while she's talking to you, your brain, you're like, you pick out different words that you're like, look that up later, look that up later, look that up later. And I feel like my profession of weaving, I feel like I understand her more and challenging myself with the structures and going to her with different, more difficult projects. And we've been able to more collaborate and me say, what do you think about this versus just listening to her. <laughs> and that's what's so fun for me is having this conversation, this dialogue, and what if, and then trying it, and Jane's willing to try it. A lot of weavers aren't as willing to experiment. They put a warp on the loom and it may or may not be successful, but they weave it without really trying something beyond. And Jane's willing to, with warp, if it doesn't work, finish that warp because she's good at that. But then she put another warp on and try it again and again. And I think we need to do that. Yeah. Put it together, it's very uh, taken with the sort of dialogue between your works. They're not what I would call similar, but but they seem to be tackling similar problems uh, or ideas. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that's been mentioned so far is uh, color. Uh, particularly Jamie. <laughs> right. so the whole color. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, well, I was trying to think about maybe why I love color so much. Um, and could have been the Catholic schools that I went to. And I could have offered up maybe, maybe be like, I really started experimenting with color when I was starting to pick out my own clothes and stuff like that. But um, I just. It brings me just so much joy to have like lots of bright colors and just to feel it in my space and my work and everything. I just want that. It it's like an immediate shot of happiness to me. So that's why I end up kind of gravitating towards color all the time. And that's just the the work that I like. That when I go around a museum, you know, across the room, if it's two bright colors together, I'm kind of drawn that way. It just brings me a lot of joy. And for me, color is much more subtle. I like color. Um, and just the, the big one, the black with the green and red coming down the stripes, very subtle on the light. I like those big bold colors, but my colors tend to be not pure, pure hues. Um, and I like the subtleties of going from dark to light within one color range, uh, like playing with color. Um, so our take on color is really important. Not just, I was this is not just color as well. Nor, uh, Jimmy's, Nora's colors are softer, more natural, and there's less, less clear repetition. Uh, whereas in Jamie's work, the, color, the, the bright colors sort of rely on the repetition of how bold, the bold repetition. I, when I was hanging up radiance number two, I actually kept lots of upside down because it, because it kept the complexity of the pattern, um, which I really is a, a flexible piece, but mm -hmm. then you have the green on the outside of the boat, the pink on the outside of the boat, then you have mm -hmm. this, this almost systemic uh, instruction of color and, and pattern and the use of the boldest color is a it's a demand pattern. So it's mm -hmm. about the whole pattern in your work. Um so for me I am not O C B about anything besides anything. <laughs> and it's it's funny like everything has to line 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 up correctly and 
equations have to be right and everything has to be even just in weaving. <laughs> um, so for me, pattern, I can put all of the really bright patterns right next to each other with also then calming it down with the pattern. You know, like I feel like, I feel like with painting, if you were to just put a lot of bright colors together, it would almost be too much. But with the warp crossing over, uh, the weft crossing over the warp, you can kind of make the colors work together evenly, but evenly. <laughs> The pattern, I, I, yeah, I'd love to know more about Norma as well, because the patterns are less, less bold, but consistently balanced. Everything is, is beautifully. Jamie's work is very balanced and very precise. Um, I, too, like things in place. I don't like chaos. I don't like things that don't balance. And I, but I love the rhythm. <clears throat> um, several years ago, I was at a conference and took a, heard a lecture on using the fan read. And it was nothing I was ever going to use, but I just absolutely fell in love with the beauty of the read. It's, um, the read is a piece of equipment in the loom in which we space the warp threads so that they're all spaced out evenly. And then we can beat the weft in with it. The fan reed, instead of having all the wires being straight, which we're all used to, has fan-shaped wires. And that's what gives all these wonderful undulations. And I just absolutely fell in love with the appearance of the reed, the fan reed. Um, I worked a lot with that. I have special ordered two more fan reeds that are uh, quite different, but I can do so much more with them. Um, so it's the rhythm that I get. Definitely a pattern. Um, and it's a pattern in a different way. So another way in which I use pattern is um, think about William Mars and his wallpaper or his printed cloth with all the little tiny vines all over and big bold tulips or parrots or whatever it is, something big and bold on this little tiny structure. It's not plain weed. There's something in there. And I, for a long time, I've tried to duplicate that effect, and I wasn't really having much luck. Um, I never could, could get the bowls on top of the little subtle. The first time I think I did is that blue piece there, which has the, the one blue and orange and the light blue coming down with it all over on the left and bolder on the right. That's one of a series that I did of it's a summer and winter leaf structure with little tiny diamonds on the left. So that's just that all over effect on one end. And then stripes that are bigger and bolder where I'm using the pattern very differently from the other one. So it's using the pattern, but not precise like Jamie's work. It's so absolutely precise. More organic. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, you both, there are, both of you have a work in the piece in the show that's inspired by Bruce Van Lee's art. Could you guys talk about both your inspiration and the dialogue and back and forth about the creation of the pieces? So Ruth Bader Ginsburg is someone who has inspired me, just like me and Paul, for years. And I started a piece sort of in commemoration of what she was doing. She was a Supreme Court judge at the time. By the time I got it on the loom, she had just died. Um, but it was going to be, and it is, um, my, my homage to her and her lace collars. She wore lace collars over her judicial robe. So if you think of pictures with uh, the men in the Supreme Court, the black robe, but she was she wore a lace collar. She had several different lace collars. I remember seeing pictures of the white ones. Um, she had a particular lace collar that she wore when she was giving a dissenting opinion, and so you knew when she wore it down to the door that, that was her dissenting opinion lace collar. So the little purple one up here 
It's again, it's a fan weave, and it's the undulation, uh, the shape, which is kind of the shape of her, her collar, and it is a lace weave. Hard to see from where you are. Um, I have done several, I think there were maybe seven pieces that came from that work. Um, there will be another one in exhibit in the fall, in which I have a long, a very long one in black and white, and two shorter ones in black and white. And that's going to be hung um, sort of kimono style, or I think of as robe, the judicial robe style. And it's all my homage to her, and I call them collars of descent. <laughs> <laughs> and on the same warp, I did one which I did not weave the lace units, just wove plain weave, but undulated, and I undulated it not symmetrically, not evenly. And that's the little black and white one on top. And turned it sideways and it became a landscape. Mm -hmm. um, so I took, did my piece, which is right here, based off of Norma's piece. And mine is called scaling. And um, scal a scaling triangle is a triangle that doesn't isn't even on all sides. Um, and based off of Norma's piece, obviously I wanted to add some purple. <laughs> um, I love that purple. And then Norma said she was using a lot of threes and triangular shapes. So that was one thing that stuck in my head as I was planning it. But then I went through and looked at some of her very diverse powers. And she had one really beautiful one that was given to her by this New Mexico chapter of women. It's definitely written better out there, the exact International name. Women's Forum. Yes. Um, and it's this beautiful kind of more modern um, triangular piece. Um, so that was how I kind of came up with this shape. And then the name, it took me forever to figure out the colors and was feeling really stressed. I have three kids and it just felt like I was listening to a Ruth Bader Ginsburg book and talking to Norma and just feeling like how did she work and have kids in a different era? It just feels like you're kind of always out of balance as a parent or as a mother, you just feel like if I'm giving too much to this, then this isn't getting enough and it just always felt uneven. So that's where the name came from. Um, if this question were asked a few years ago, I would have said Madeline Van Hoop. Um, those of you who will be virtual recognize that. She's an incredible structure person. And structure is really important for me. We structure, the structure that you produce on the loom changes the effect that you want. Or as you can do with what Jamie's done, you can take a weave structure and produce exactly what you want. So learning different weave structures have been important, and I have admired Madeline Vanderhoop for years. I think at this point I have explored structure so much that I can do this on my own. Mm -hmm. And the person that I would love to spend time with was Judith Poxon Fox, who was a tapestry weaver, large tapestry. She was Pacific Northwest, Oregon. She lived in Oregon, um, exhibited in Seattle, in that whole area. Um, I've read her biography. She's had quite an amazing life, a lot of tragedy in her life. But she wove these large tapestries with a lot of geometrics. And there would be geometrics that would kind of swim through a river or flow through a landscape. Um, a lot of flowing, a lot of wonderful, deep, rich colors. And I just, I truly admire her work. Um, I've not woven something yet inspired by her. But I probably will, or maybe a collection of some of her work. It works amazing. Um, for me, I just went the other day on a recommendation from Kate Harbour to see the, um, there was a show up at the Harvard Art Museum. Um, the exact title is escaping me. But there was a weaver that I've never actually come across any of her work named Audie Berger who was a teacher at the Bauhaus, and her work was just really beautiful, like really bold lines and bold colors, and she was kind of experimenting with 
technology to different chemicals and different plastics within her work. And so right away, I'd like, you know, taking a bunch of pictures of her work. And then, you know, as you're going through the museum, I'm one of those annoying people that reads every <laughs> piece of time off. And I was like, I can't wait to like look up more of her work. Where did this go? And she had been killed in the Holocaust. And just to think of someone who's just her career just could have been endless. It was just really, so it was such a, the show was a lot of any hours in that time period and um, just kind of coming, see, just being so inspired by the few things that she had. I just would have loved to have been her and I would have kind of seen more of her trajectory. <clears throat> see a lot of Bauhaus Tension like that. Um, and traditionally, cloth is not framed. Its tapestries are hung on the walls and they are not absolutely rigid. They waver a little bit and they certainly undulate a little bit on the bottom. Um, it's very typical, uh, traditional of wall hangings to not frame them. Um, and, however, I I wove a piece particularly for an exhibit that I was going to enter. Um, I knew who the judge was, Archie Brennan. I know his, knew his wonderful sense of humor, and he was a beautiful tapestry weaver. And I wove this small piece with kind of a woman back, riding backwards on a horse, and I gave it a corny name that he would have loved. And I had it professionally photographed and professionally framed, and I sent it off to the exhibit, and it was rejected. <laughs> and I had put so much thought into this that it, it, I never expected to be rejected from that show. But the upshot was he wrote a very thoughtful letter about why it was rejected. And it was rejected because woven works are not to be framed. Tapestry. <laughs> <laughs> Tapestry can be sewn onto a canvas back so you can have a tapestry with canvas around it and that can go around a, a canvas stretcher but you don't frame tapestries, you don't frame weavings. And I, you know, I actually, it was good in the long run. I was talking with someone at a national conference and bemoaning the fact that I had just been rejected and it hurt and, and I had talked about a lot about why I was framing it and why I wouldn't again. And she said, you know, that sounds like a talk. <laughs> and so for the following conference, two years later, I gave a talk on why you frame or don't, how you frame weavings. And I put a lot of thought into Oh, cloth shouldn't just kind of run off the edges. There should be boundaries, borders. Um, if you look at a lot of the things that I do, they're dark around the edges. It kind of frames it. Or I'll have a different weave structure on the edges. So I'm conscious of the sides, but I don't frame pieces. And I, you know, I guess I haven't since. I'm not against it, and I may well frame it again. <laughs> <laughs> And look how successful the frame is. <laughs> well, so I started framing things because of this one piece based off of the Solowitz piece because I really wanted it to. So Solowitz's work is out at the Mass Mocha. If anybody hasn't been, he's got a huge building of all his work. It's a, it's beautiful, but it's just 
you know, floor to ceiling, 20 foot ceilings, these giant pieces. And I really wanted that piece to rep represent this, this whole piece that he had. So that's kind of my, how I ended up getting that. And also too, I couldn't figure out how to, how I could, he could replicate that in the same way without framing it. Oh, okay. And yeah. So yeah. 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 The repetition of the geometry is it's essential. Yeah. And so I really loved also too how I could get, I could just show you what I wanted to show you. Besides, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, um, and this one, my brother helped me do all of the matting, and that was amazing because we just, we were back and forth on the phone saying like, okay, I think you need to take a little bit more off here and a little bit more off there. And so thank you, Kevin. Um, who's here? <laughs> but then I think it kind of started to go with, with Radiant. Um, this was for a specific coffee shop that my friend let me exhibit it in Brooklyn and they had gray walls. And I was like, what would like pop off those gray walls? And I thought the white, and then also too, because this piece, so this piece is all of those pieces. They're the same work. Um, are based off of Pierre Car a Pierre Cardin show I saw, which Pierre Cardin is a designer from the 50s and 60s where it's just like black or white and a color. So that's why those ended up being white um, frames. And again, I could cut off and frame it the way I wanted to and cut stuff off and make it all different shapes. Then it turns out the chessboards is a totally, it's framed again. It's just as framed as a chessboard. I just feel like for me, I have always thought not really of myself as an artist, but more of a designer or a sewer and fashion stuff. So, so to be an artist, it has to be framed, <laughs> you know? Um, but also too, um, when I leave, I pull that, pull it off the loom and it's yardage and it's fabric. And as a, as a fashion design major, that is, you make something with fabric. You do something with it. Yeah, it's, a, it's something you make something out of and cut and shape. And so I think that that's why it ends up, I can't just leave it as is. It needs to be perfect in something else. <laughs> about how to hang how to hang your work and I left being like it would be a challenge for me to make something that just hung and I should because like cloth is supposed to you're supposed to see the movement of it and under with what Norma the way that she looks at it um, you see the movement and with mine you don't see the movement so that's kind of in the future <laughs> I'm going to test myself to see if I can do something that you can see the movie On the other hand, I think that these framed pieces are wonderful. And, and actually, um, Katie Kellum is sitting here in the front row. I remember years ago, she found small pieces of a textile, a, a fragment from, you know, a blanket from a coverlet from hundreds of years ago. And there wasn't much left of the fragment, but she framed it, put it on the wall, and had, I think still has several of these that um, it brings honor and distinction to the piece. You really notice it. If it were just there, you wouldn't pay much attention to it. But framed, it makes it, it makes a statement that this is worth looking at. Um, so that's definitely a great reason for framing. A reason that I will not frame a lot of my pieces are because of the fan read that I use and the undulations I get. And several of these you can see undulate. So this is on purpose. I want my selvages either to undulate opposing or parallel to each other. But it's a conscious decision 
that, that I make, and, and that undulation is in relation to the rest of the cloth, the undulations in the cloth. This is, this is how I kept coming across when I was, when I was hanging over and, and going to the exhibition, is that you, a lot of times, are both tackling the same thing, but from completely different angles, because your work, because of the, that three-dimensionality, has a sculptural quality to it. Right. But also, likewise, um, Pierre Cardin's work is meant for being structural. It, uh -huh. it, much like your, but this is your lovely <laughs> it, it has its own shape, and it's a uh -huh. participation conversation. <laughs> organic versus it's not organic. It's like yeah. <laughs> um, Oh yeah, sure. So I, I think it was interesting uh, on the framing thing that you said about how like sewing on the back to add uh, what fabric and then you could frame it so it would be framed behind but not. And then I think one of the things that you said is like um, you, you like how you can control it. I think one thing that's interesting is that you know when you weave it's under tension, right? And when you take it off, it's not under tension. That changes. And it's sometimes if you're framing it. Like you might have it under some kind of tension, like because I gotta help with Jamie's. Um, <laughs> yeah. I gotta help with the chess boards, and it was kind of like, well, how much tension can you re-put in before it changes the shape of things? So I'm wondering if that also has an impact on whether you frame it or not, or how how you look at the piece, and and just kind of in general talking about the idea of like this thing is gonna change from what you wove to when you take it off. Right, and, and are you trying to get back to what it looked like when you were weaving it, or are you more interested in what it's going to be like differently when it's off, and does that have, has that play? And I don't know if that's a question or what. It's a good question, and I think um, we have a vision of what we want to have in, at the end. And if it's going to be drapey, then we're not going to frame it. Uh, but if we want it to be held under tension, we weave it so that when it comes off and we put it under tension, it will look proper. However, when it's on the loom and then off the loom, or, off the loom it relaxes. The warp relaxes, the weft relaxes, and depending on what it is, it may or may not need to be washed or steamed, um, blocked somehow. Maybe it needs to be blocked to get it square. So all of that has to be taken into consideration before you actually get to the framing process. And then whether it gets framed or not is another thing. And so also with um, wall hangings that are not framed, there has to be something rigid at the top and it can show that little tiny piece up there has a, it's a sweet little hanging um, that Gary Pelletier makes, a uh, hanging device. So that that can become part of the the display. Most of mine have um, something rigid at the bottom which holds the cloth out straight, but it can back and go back and forth. And that provides a weight, so it holds everything down straight. Um, so that's some tension. For me, I'm wanting it to look exactly like it did on the head. I'm wanting it to be tight. I will come in with like a pin and like loom a couple of threads to make it exactly the way that, yeah, I've got like the, for the chessboard specifically, we bought these little tiny nails and just like, there's probably 200 nails under there. Like just making sure the, the it was perfectly square. I want it to be exactly like it was on the um, When I like take it off the loop and it kind of comes together a little bit, I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how naive this question is, but the blue undulating stripes, I just I love that so much. How do you get those shaded circular areas? Where does it come? That's with the reed, the fan reed. So the fan is, you know, it's fan shaped, and the reed gets moved up and down as I weave. So when I have the, the reed lowered, 
where the fan is spread out, the warp is forced out, and you see the warp, you don't see as much of the weft. That's the shaded part. And then when you move the reed so that you're weaving through the, the tight part of the fan, the warp is close together, and you see all the warp, not the weft. So that's, and that makes the ovals. And you can either do it regularly or irregularly, depending on the effect you want. Something that um, I would love to do, the Japanese have done a lot with beautiful undulation. Um, they've used the fan reads, just beautiful. And there's a, in the book, I have, I think, 18 photographs by the chap, that um, John Marshall sent pictures of from his collection of close-ups of either warp undulation or undulation or weft undulation. And there's one in there in which the undulations are squares. And I don't know how they get that. I'm trying. Read <laughs> <laughs> one is as close as I've come to make squares rather than ovals. And you know, I've got a ways to go exploring that even further. And the reason that's there is just because I love the fact that I'm beginning to get squares and mm -hmm. don't yet have them. I uh, can't recommend your book. I mean, yeah, I, I not a confirm that it's out in the books. Well, his photographs. Yeah, the bookstore. Yes. <laughs> yes, two of us. And his photographs are just wonderful. And the one piece that has amazed me here, and this has to do with tension on the loom and the fiber you use. If you weave with linen, it tends to absorb moisture and it moves a little bit. Um, I did a couple of table runners in lace and tabby weave and plain weave. And they were, so they were under tension, they were all straight. I took them off the loom and I ironed them and I could iron them because I did it right away and it was all flat. But a day or two later, after the linen sat in human condition, the parts of it just puckered. And so you can no longer iron it when it's puckered because it'll be puckered here or puckered here. And there's no place to put the iron down to smooth anything out. It just otherwise you get wrinkles. Um, I've grown to like the puckers. <laughs> <laughs> Does it depend on the fiber you use? One piece that's hung in my closet for a couple of years and has just been fairly straight with a little bit of puckering has come into its own. And that's the bright blue one here. I've never seen a pucker like that before. I, just, I love the fact that it's very three-dimensional and that can be enhanced. You know, I can make it, if I increase my undulation, if I increase the number of time, frequency in which I raise and lower my read, I can get more puckering. <laughs> I've done that, but I just that one was so much flatter until it came in here. So it sounds like when you get on the loom, you're making quite a commitment. <laughs> <laughs> so, could you share more about the process? Because you talked about your inspiration. But, you know, do you have a sketchbook? Do you put your ideas down? Um, do you work with the fabric? Do you make notes about 2D versus 3D? Is there, you know, what's that process like? You take very good notes. That's the first rule. Um, there's a lot of math, but it's not difficult math. It's very logical. And so you, you figure out what kind of things you want to create, whether it's blankets or scarves or towels or artwork, and then you would choose a loom that's suitable for you and for what you want to do. And um, a lot of us have chosen the loom we thought was right, and a few years later, we <laughs> upgrade, and then maybe upgrade again, because the, the selection of looms out there is incredible, and it keeps getting more complex. Um, the yards. The, Choosing your yarns, what are you going to weave? So it's a huge learning curve with yarns. And for me, it's basically trying trial and error. You really do have to think about errors. Um, and trying them again. There are good weaving books, there are fabulous weaving books out there, weaving journals, um, weaving workshops, going to weaving exhibits. There are a lot of them. Right now, there's a weaving exhibit at the 
uh, Rhode Island Weaving Center in Wakefield. Um, I would, if anybody's interested in weaving, I would certainly go there. Um, there's uh, going to be our, a weaving exhibit in Fall River in September. If you have a chance, go see that. Just getting exposed to different weavings. And so it's looking at different cloths to begin with. And you want to make blankets, and why is a blanket soft and fuzzy and a rug is harsh? And so you get the right fibers for something like that. And then you make good notes. And there are record sheets that you can get that will keep you in line with everything you need to remember right now. I think that also, too, for non weavers, there's the process is long where you're first you're making the plan, then you're writing the notes, then you're planning the warp, which is the vertical of the cloth, and then getting that. First, you wind that, just every thread coming out. That takes time. And then putting it on your loom, and then having your friends help you wind it on the loom. <laughs> And then going through the heddles, through the reed, like there's always, there's about 20 steps before you even start weaving. And um, that normally takes up more time than the actual weaving. And then it is, a lot of it is with the fibers, like I'll try something, like the radiant is, I did bamboo in that, and bamboo is super slippery, which I didn't know. And then um, I went back to cotton, which is the chess boards. So I was like, oh, I know how this reacts. But then I really liked, I had one color in this that I liked, but it was a really, really thin thread. So then the whole thing had to be thin. So every weaving that you do, you're building up like more knowledge of, okay, so I won't do a 10 to cotton double weave pickup for the weavers in here, you know. <laughs> I probably, again, I'll do a little bit of a thicker yarn to get faster results. So every time you do a weaving, it's like you're narrowing down what you do next or what you could use. But then you like see what a friend's doing and you're like, well, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's very true with the weaving school that um, with 20 different, 25 different groups set up and projects on them. And I'm sure at the Rhode Island Weaving Center, it's the same way. You'll see a color combination that you really like, and you're going to put that into your next whatever you weave, or that weave structure. And a weave structure will, kind of, it's kind of almost contagious, will go through the school, <laughs> or through the center, because everybody wants to try it, because it really is pretty neat, and each person brings something different to it. So it's always growing. Question for you, Jamie. Um, when you were speaking earlier about framing the work, you know, you would like to at some point consider not bringing your work. Have you thought of bringing your fabrics into your fashion? Because that would allow it not, obviously, not to be yeah. framed and to have um, a yeah, definitely. form. So she was asking me if anybody did here if I would use some of my fabrics to make clothes and, and how that would not be framed. And yes, definitely. Because that's what actually I was doing before I started doing more artwork. I was making yardage and then. I was making headbands and different accessories um, and doing that, but there's definitely a plan to do, well, I have, a, I have a couch that's getting covered by a friend after I finish 15 yards of this plan. <laughs> and then I have, you know, every time I see like a chair that I like, I'm like, ooh, but what if that chair I had my own fabric on it? Like, <laughs> so it's definitely on my mind, and I definitely do that whole eventually start making more clothes again too with my own fabrics. Yeah, you this vest and you have on the Do you make a lot of I do not sew. Um, I have some good reading friends who do sew. And it's it's important if you can find someone who knows how to weave who's going to do the sewing because working with hand movements is a different thing. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. But I, I do weave, um, and so often my projects, if I have to do a, a particular project, I will put on an extra yard and a half or two yards at the end of the warp, knowing I want to make cloths out of it, and make it, and then I will find somebody who will sell it for me, if the, if the cloth is suitable for that, for a garment. 
I have a final question for you guys. Uh, each of you. Uh, what are your two favorite works from the Mural of Women? In this in this exhibition. My two favorite works? Yes. One of Jane's favorite works. Let me think about that. Oh, okay. I'll <laughs> go. Um, I think this one is my favorite, Skateley. Um, it was really challenging. It was really, it took me a really long time just to figure out the colors. Like, so I kept adding something and, and weaving, like we said, it's such a long process that if I were to work with a color I'd like, uh, I would be miserable for six months. <laughs> so it took a really long time to come up with colors, but then it was like a puzzle trying to figure out because it's, it's lots of different aspects. Because weaving is like, in fact, you know, your warp and your weft. This piece has multiple color, almost like stations. So trying to figure out how to keep one color in one place was really challenging. And then it's also from, it's, uh, I got the inspiration from this great weaving book, Double Weave by Jennifer Moore. And it's literally the last page of the book. I was like, <laughs> go to the hardest thing. So it was really challenging, but it came out like exactly how I wanted it to. Um, and it kind of, I know that now, so the chessboards are also the same structure, double weave, but I see myself going down this path and really trying to figure out more double weave, more double weave pickup more shafts and really trying to get the exact colors I want where, where I, wherever I can get them. And then Norma's, my favorite Norma piece is the Ruth Bader Ginsburg one. Um, and I really like this one, but <laughs> <laughs> this one, um, she knows it's my favorite and that's why we ended up doing the project together on it. But it just, um, I think that when Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away at our school, I think we all had a, a lot of reaction to it. And I think um, really knowing that women of Norma's generation and Ruth Bader Ginsburg generation like, had worked so hard to for my generation and for us to be where we are, I just it just has a whole lot, extra layer of sentiment to it. I love all of Norma's work, but this specifically, just being with our group at school and her own feeling. And seeing it on the wall as it progressed. Yeah, it was just, it was a special piece. And then to be able to work, to make something based off of it is really special. Thanks. So for mine, I'm, I'm just amazed at this blue piece because it looks so different here, but I knew what it looked like before I came here. So I don't know if that would be my favorite. The, the sort of three pieces off of work are the bluish gray, the bluish gray in the back, and the green in the middle. And maybe the one in the far right, which I think is called, I think that's the one called Phoenix Cherry, because there is a little bit of peacock, which is a space dyed warp thread that goes through it, just very subtle. And it was Ecot died by Katie Shelley years and years ago, and I just kept this little ball jar until I had a chance to use it. You know, I just think it was perfect there. But I, certainly my undulation work is my favorite. I think it's that one. And for me, of Jamie's, it's the one here. And it's, partly it's the weave structure. I know this always, I'm always affected by a complex or a, well done we structure, and that one is phenomenal. And then the design, the colors and the design is wonderful. Well, that's my favorite of yours by a long shot. <laughs> by a long shot. <laughs> 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 and I would have trouble speaking out with one and one of the others because there are so much similarity. Thank you both very much. Thank you for the exhibition and for answering your questions. And thank you everyone for coming. Thanks so much for coming.